Dear Director General Fatih Wali, dear Secretary General Lansky Diefendal, dear Under Secretary General Excellencies are in the room and on live stream, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for me, on behalf of the Vienna School of International Studies, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here for our international conference, a two days conference on reinvigorating the United Nations systems. Um, I'm not surprised that there is such a strong interest in the topic. And I'm very thankful for all the partners which made this conference possible, especially the mission of Italy, especially Canada, but also Austrian institutions like the Austrian Research Association uh, and uh, partners from the UN Research and, 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 and uh, let's call it uh, think tank cap capabilities that we have in this world. Uh, and the topic that we have chosen, reinvigorating the United Nations system, tells you already a story. The story is, first of all, that we believe in the system. Secondly, we feel that it needs something new. It needs to be reinvigorated. Uh, and uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations is not leaving out any single speech in the last few years saying that this system is not working, that we are already beyond the brink, he is saying. I could give you the examples of what he said, for instance, at the last General Assembly, where he said the United Nations Charter and its ideals are in jeopardy. He did even say more. He said the international community is not ready or willing to tackle the big traumatic challenges of our time. Uh, and finally, he said, no cooperation, no dialogue, no collective problem uh, solving. Could you imagine the CEO of a company saying that about his company? So obviously, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Uh, and this is the reason why we think it is worth to try to bring together those who think about the system, together with policy shapers, policy makers, those responsible for the individual parts of the system, to discuss whether there is a pragmatic way forward. Mr. Guterres and others are saying, and I agree, that uh, the UN system was built after a catastrophe, after the Second World War. And when we think about it, it was built when one superpower at the time started a war and lost the war. And then the rest of the international community decided to form such a global system. I'm not saying that we're in a similar situation, but if we talk about Zeitenwende, the epochal shift, uh, then we come to think about, is it time for pragmatic reinvigorating a system or for a more dramatic change. Maybe this comes also up in, in our discussion. I, I think the two major questions we always have to ask in any organization, how functional is it for the given situation, which is so different from 1945? Did it, did it really adjust to the times and the changes? Is this a fundamental shift also at Zeitenwende for the system or not? These are all important questions. But on the basis of it, as we teach also to our students here at the Diplomatic Academy, is how just, how fair is this system? Are these challenges just because it needs adaptation of, of the functions of the, of the various parts of the system? Do we need to invest more in the, in the World Health Organization, for instance, which we obviously should? Uh, or is it the problem of, is the system just? Does it include all those who sh it should include into the system? And this is the most difficult question, as we know, because it's one of the issues there is the Security Council of the United Nations and who should be in it and who should be not in it. And again, the General Assembly of the United Nations started a discussion about the Security Council in 2008. This is 15 years already by now. Where are we from there? Maybe I'm not well informed enough sitting here in Vienna, but I, I feel 
it needs a reinvigoration. It needs this sort of discussion. But I don't want to be too pathetic or too pessimistic. I just wanted to say it's worth reinvigorating the United Nations systems. I, and I welcome you all here at the Diplomatic Academy. Good afternoon, everyone. Ambassador Briggs, Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to join you today to discuss a highly relevant topic at a very important moment for the world. For almost eight decades, the United Nations has been at the heart of an international order espousing equality and friendly relations among nations peaceful resolution of disputes, and international cooperation to address global problems and promote human rights. The pursuit of those principles was imperfect, but it made for a more peaceful world for a while. Now that international order is coming under threat and we may be facing a turning point in history, the principles embodied by the UN are being tested and we must do everything we can to safeguard them. Conflicts and violence are engulfing the world, with around a quarter of the global population living in conflict-affected areas, where simmering tensions threaten to explode everywhere. War in Ukraine, death in the Middle East, lawlessness in Haiti, escalation in the Pacific, a surge of terrorism in the Sahel, and the list goes on. Stability is eroding every day, everywhere. Divisions between East and West grow dangerously deep, while the economic gap between the North and South expands. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed global inequalities. While some contemplated vaccine options, others had neither vaccines nor hospital beds. Meanwhile, Oxfam estimates that the richest 1% of people have acquired almost two thirds of all new wealth since 2020. The divides are just as deep in domestic and regional contexts with politics becoming polarized and extremism running rampant in many parts of the world. Globalization is put in question, while events continue to show just how interconnected our world is. The expansion of digital spaces and the growing amount of time people are spending online have given rise to security risks and blind spots, as well as difficult questions about privacy, freedom, and responsibility. Hateful and insightful rhetoric spreads with alarming ease and misinformation wins too many battles against facts. At the same time, access to technology and digital advantages remain deeply unequal, furthering divisions. Trust is dangerously in short supply. Trust between nations, trust between generations, trust between different segments of society and trust of people in their governments. All of this against the backdrop of a planet that we are cooking into oblivion as climate change threatens irreversible damage. The chaotic state of the world translates into direct and severe impact on people's lives every day. A record 100 million people were forcibly displaced only last year. Gains against poverty are being lost and human rights progress is being reversed. In Afghanistan, women and girls have been denied their right to education an astonishing reversal that shows how far back we can go. It is a bleak and alarming picture, but it confirms rather than questions the importance of the UN. When the world has needed transformative action, the UN has historically proven to be crucial. It was the UN that provided the platform to move from a world where nearly a third of all people lived in territories reliant on colonial powers to the post-colonial world we live in today. It was the UN that brought the countries of the world together to elaborate a universal declaration on human rights. In my own country, Egypt, when conflict broke out in 1956, it was the UN General Assembly that chose to stand united for peace and help stop the hostilities. And through the years, the UN has been a voice and a defender of the marginalized and the vulnerable. Specialized agencies with global reach have been established to help refugees, to support children, and to stand up for women and their rights. The UN has also been a powerful voice for Mother Earth, promoting science and calling for the urgently needed course co correction towards a greener future. Today, the UN system is present and delivering aid in conflict and crisis areas around the world, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, 
and helping those in need. When COVID crippled the world, the UN pushed for equitable vaccination through COVAX and made the case for Africa's need for vaccines. When food prices soared, the UN brokered the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which has facilitated the export of more than 18 million metric tons of grains and foodstuff. As violence spreads, more than 87,000 UN peacekeepers around the world are putting their lives on the line every day to protect people. Meanwhile, the UN remains the platform for dialogue with its unmatched convening power. Even amidst historic divisions, the world can still come together at the UN to work towards peace and to pool expertise and resources to solve global problems. Here in Vienna, the UN system presence exemplifies the power of multilateral action. The UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which I have the honor to lead, is helping countries address challenges such as organized crime, corruption, and violent extremism, terrorism, providing assistance in the face of growing risks and vulnerabilities. The International Atomic Agency is playing a crucial role in preventing nuclear catastrophe in Ukraine. UNIDO is promoting and accelerating sustainable industrial development. And the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, PREPCOM, is helping to keep a watchful eye on nuclear testing. Excellencies, the UN is taking the initiative to adapt to the needs of our age and to write the course on our path to the Sustainable Development Goals. During the last few years, the United Nations development system has been undergoing extensive reform to provide clearer frameworks that meet needs on the ground, ensure synergies, and maximize impact. The UN is present and delivering, but challenges at hand are unprecedented, and we must break new grounds. Leading the way is the Secretary General's report on our common agenda, launched in 2021, and currently guiding action across the UN system. The report outlines a vision to accelerate the implementation of existing agreements, most notably the 2030 Agenda, underlining trust, inclusion, sustainability, justice, prevention, and partnership. It specifically addresses the need to upgrade the UN to meet modern challenges, pursuing a new UN.0 through better data and analysis, innovation and digital transformation, strategic foresight, performance and results orientation, and behavioral science. The report on our common agenda also envisions a stronger multilateral system centered around the UN, including a new agenda for peace, with greater investment in peace building, reshaped responses to violence, and new ideas for risk reduction and adaptation. Inclusion is at the core of the UN's future. Gender equality has become a priority across the UN, both in our work and in our offices. A new UN office on youth has been established and the role of non-governmental stakeholders is growing across the UN. Meanwhile, the Secretary General's call to action on human rights launched in 2020 remains highly relevant to fight back against dangerous reversals. Equally important are his repeated calls to fix an unequal international financial system, to relieve developing countries of debt, and to agree on a global SDG stimulus package for countries of the global south. There are signs of hope. The COP27 climate conference took a historic step towards climate justice by establishing the long-awaited loss and damage fund. And as we look forward, I'm hopeful that the 2024 Summit for the Future will be an opportunity to revitalize multilateralism and to make further progress towards a stronger United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations is striving to rise to the challenges ahead. But that is only half of the equation. The other half lies with the member states of the UN and their willingness to support the organization, uphold its values, and abide by the international order. Their commitment to invest human and financial resources is also paramount. The world does not need a new order. It needs to return to order and to protect the values that have brought us so far since 1945. We need to restore the belief in multilateral solutions and collective action and to breathe new life into multilateralism with the UN at its heart. We simply need to commit to truly working together for justice and for peace. The ones with the most at stake are people and societies that must, they must take the lead in calling for a world united. Young people in particular must speak up, and I see many of them in this room, and must be heard. They are the voice of tomorrow. Civil society organizations are important advocates for the values of the UN Charter. Academia, and we are in one, is a defender of reason and virtues of a rules-based international order. 
The United Nations can only be as strong as the faith that people, societies, and countries have in what it represents. At this pivotal moment, let us preserve the belief that security and prosperity are a shared global responsibility and that a world working together is a better world. So I thank you, I thank you for the Diplomatic Academy for uh, discussing this timely and important conference and I thank you for inviting me here today. And you may have noticed I have not discussed the Security Council, leaving it to the able hands of Secretary General. Distinguished uh, Director General Gada Wali, uh, President of the ICC, Piotr Hovmanski, Under Secretary General Amandeep Gil Singh, former Under Secretary General Shashi Sarur, and uh, someone I haven't seen, but I also wanted to mention is Franz Baumann, former ASG. Where are you, Franz? Over there. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, distinguished speakers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to be back among the UN family and among those of us who really care about the strength of the United Nations and uh, of the importance of uh, its work. I feel honored uh, to be able to welcome all of you on behalf of uh, Foreign Minister Alexander Schallenberg here to the Diplomatic Academy and I would like to thank you, Ambassador Brix, uh, lieber Emil, uh, for hosting us once again not just for this, but for so many other occasions, and we feel very much at home here at the Diplomatic Academy. We highly value all uh, of uh, your time that you've spent uh, on, and you are spending on the United Nations and your commitment um, to the United Nations, which I get all of us consider the heart of the multilateral architecture worldwide and also here in Vienna. Many thanks go to you. If I may say, dear Gada, for the strong personal support you and your organization have lent uh, to this conference and your strong support to Vienna as uh, one of the UN headquarters. Austria's foreign policy, its standing in the world and in international fora would be unthinkable without our unwavering commitment to multilateral uh, diplomacy, to close cooperation and partnership with the United Nations and its member states. We are extremely grateful that Vienna has been the seat of international organizations going back to the 1950s, and as you know, since 1979, we've been very proud host of one of the UN headquarters, global headquarters here at the Vienna International Center. Um, we very much cherish the work of the Vienna-based organizations such as UNOV, UNODC, UNOSA, IEA, CTBTO, and UNIDO to just mention a few. Uh, they've made it possible to create a major hub for international security and sustainability representing the interests of and serving the entire world community. The continuous and long-term contributions of the Vienna-based organizations to the overall work of the United Nations system are invaluable and irreplaceable. 11 months ago, the international security architecture was profoundly shaken by Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, a war of aggression by a permanent member of the Security Council against another sovereign state a blatant breach of the Charter of the United Nations and of international law. However, the adoption of the three UN Gen General Assembly resolutions on the aggression against Ukraine, on the humanitarian consequences, and on the in, uh, territorial integrity since the start of the war by consistently 140 or more uh, member states demonstrates the broad support of UN member states for compliance with the UN Charter and the values of the multilateral system. Our values and rules-based uh, international order as it was built by the international community 
after World War II is being undermined, is being threatened, and is under severe attack. The world is facing complex new realities, as so adequately described by the Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his landmark report, Our Common Agenda, with his many recommendations. The driving ambition and the goal of our joint multilateral engagement surely must remain. Defending, preserving, strengthening our rules-based international order with the United Nations at its center. The success of this endeavor is the sine qua non for our security and our well-being. The two-day conference, our two-day conference here on reinvigorating the United Nations focuses on the greatest and most important challenges, upholding the principles of the United Nations Charter, widening peace and security, development, human rights, democracy, justice, the rule of law, and the governance for the future in the areas of technology, climate, and health. Let me express again our gratitude to you, Director Briggs, to Professor Korn Popst, as well as Dr. Rido from the United Nations Studies Association for initiating and for organizing uh, this conference. We are convinced that the choice of topics coupled with the excellent panelists from all parts of the world will guarantee stimulating conversations, a fruitful exchange of ideas and valuable input for the future of the United Nations. We, I wish you much success and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.